Welcome to Damon Bruce Plus, and boy, this is a conversation I've been waiting to have for a long time. From The Athletic, he covers the 49ers so very well, David Lombardi. What's going on, man? How are you? Doing great. It's been a lot of travel, and because we I did an East Coast swing for Labor Day weekend, and then I came back for three days and back to the East Coast or the Eastern time zone to Pittsburgh. It's all been worth it. The season is off to a good start for the 49ers, and buckle up because this is going to be this is going to be a crazy ride. You thought that this offseason drama was nuts. Well, just wait until all these actual games start stringing together and we get the storylines from week 1 moving to week 2 and it's where we're at right now about I know some LA. people I know some people who really like to cover training camp more than the regular season or the playoffs, but you and I are not those type of people. So let's talk about what's actually happened while the light is green and traffic is flowing and it all really, really matters. Uh, David, we're 48 hours removed at the time we're talking here from the 49ers week one rousing win in Pittsburgh. You've had a couple of nights to sleep on it. What is your biggest takeaway 48 hours after the fact from what we saw on Sunday? Well, the 49ers have a lower burden of proof than a lot of teams in the league because they've been the three of the past four NFC championship games. So, you know, you always want to see something positive from every team in the NFL in week one. But even if you see something positive, you could disqualify it or just raise the bar a little bit higher and say it was only week one. The thing with the 49ers is they have this track record. They still have the same core. They've only added to the core, really, with Javon Hargrave, and they look damn good in week one. So I think that's that's a legitimate announcement that they are true Super Bowl contenders this season. I think that's that's my takeaway. They look good in all three phases of the game. And again, they were only adding on to the reputation they've built over the last several seasons under Kyle Shanahan. So they're locked, loaded, ready to go for week two. And the big difference between this season and the start of last season is that they've got their quarterback in place. It, yes, they had Trey Lance start last season, but they were so open about it in week one. They said, we're going to have to prop Trey up. We're, we're going to have to give him some developmental runway over the course of the 2022 season. We never saw how that experiment would have turned out had he stayed healthy because he got hurt in week two. But now, you know, they don't need to experiment with that kind of stuff. Purdy's ready to go now. That That's what we saw in week one. And as we know, that's the most important position. And I think that's why the vibes around the 49ers are so good right now. I'll tell you, I haven't seen a 49er quarterback pop up from a play where they run a little forward and, like, give the red cash in first down with his bit. Like, it probably isn't a lot of fun being Kyle Shanahan's quarterback. There's a lot of pressure. There's a huge ask. Uh, he was having fun. I mean, you put a little fun, you know, yeah. look good, feel good, play good. I swear to God, it's a winning formula. It was really good to see that. It, yeah, yeah. I mean, and Brock Purdy, he's so buttoned up during the week, especially when we're in the locker room. He's there studying off the iPad or the Microsoft Surface, if I want to be correct about my product placement here. But he's always he's there right. in the corner of the locker room. He's He's working hard. And on the field, too, Fairly buttoned up demeanor, business-like. But then there are those moments of celebration when you see the passion and enthusiasm. And there was a great one last year that showed us such great insight into Purdy's development and, and Kyle Shanahan, the whole thing. And that was against the Raiders. And it was either the first or the second touchdown against the Raiders. Purdy went off schedule, and he found George Kittle in the back of the end zone. Physically, it was a spectacular play. Flipping the hips, firing to the back of the end zone. Kittle made a great catch. It was a perfectly placed throw. But what people didn't realize at the time was that he just missed his first read. It should have been an easy touchdown to Jawan Jennings, who broke out on the out pattern. And Purdy missed him. And there's nothing that upsets Kyle Shanahan more than a quarterback missing the first read because Kyle feels that he's the best in the game at scheming the first read. And Purdy missed it, and he made the play way more exciting than it should have been. And Kyle was actually upset on the sideline. He saw the missed read, and then he notices that it was a touchdown. But Kyle's more of a process guy. He's like, damn it, you know, he missed the, the read. This is, I don't like this. And Kyle's kind of stewing. But Purdy, after throwing the touchdown, just goes crazy, looks at the sideline, and does the whole ice in my veins thing toward Kyle <laughs> Shanahan. And Kyle says that even he couldn't help it. He just cracked up. And if, if you know Kyle Shanahan, he, he actually was pissed when Brock Purdy missed the first read on that play. He didn't care that it was a touchdown. So the fact that Brock Purdy's show of emotion there could even get the head coach to crack up, 
th there's something about that. You know, the humanity of these things is really important. That's how you build. I mean, the 49ers have built this locker room that, you know, they try to instill a college like vibe in there. So it's not just a bunch of mercenaries. I think that's why you see Ray Ray McLeod told me the other day. I asked him, you know, about the block for um, for Christian McCaffrey. And he said, you know, I sprinted 70 yards across the whole field because I like Christian McCaffrey. That's my dog. That's what he said. And, you know, a lot of people say this is just like Disney movie stuff. You know, that's that's just a cliche. I actually think it's a thing. You know, when you look at the humanity in the locker room and in sports and if the 49ers have built a tight knit locker room that has personality where the guys like each other, that can give you that extra one or two percent. So you talk about Brock Purdy's personality. Well, it showed in that game against the Raiders. And I think it showed a little bit after the touchdown to Brandon Ayuk and after the first down scramble that you talked about. Um, I think these things are important. You know, I don't think that that they're going to make or break and, uh, you know, entire games. But I think one percent at a time uh, can be the difference here and there. And as we cover a team, we should definitely document it. That McCaffrey run coming with that downfield blocking. I'm guessing Kyle Shanahan went home and just watched that one play five thousand times in a row. That's like everything the man preaches about his running game popping for explosive plays. David Lombardi of The Athletic, it is great to have you here. Um, no harm, no foul on the Bosa contract. Obviously, they got him in. Um, you know, he's in great shape. He's not in football shape. I think he's going to look even better against the Rams coming up on Sunday. What was amazing to me about the entire deal, though, is that when I looked at it, I didn't get any sticker shock. Not at all. Not at all. I mean, it's every number that came in in the Bosa contract to me looked like a number that probably could have been reached and agreed to a month ago. What was the delay in your opinion? Well, I think that both sides were trying to squeeze the best possible deal out of each other. The 49ers had to make sure that this was structured in a way that could be salary cap sustainable. It is, as you've seen now that the details have come out. They have this whole triple option structure, which has only been used a couple times before for Jalen Hurts and I believe for Justin Herbert. So now it's been used for a non-quarterback. It's kind of a rolling way to keep the cap hits low early. So the 49ers wanted to... You know, and they had to dedicate a whole ton of guaranteed money to make something like that work the way that they needed it to, to fit under the cap. Because the more, the bigger the signing bonus is, the more you could prorate the cap, stretch it out. They gave him a $50 million signing bonus. The previous high at that position was TJ Watt, $35.6 million. That's a 40% increase from the previous high. You don't see an increase that big. So I think the 49ers probably had to move the number up. They, it's it's about how much were they willing to commit to guaranteed money to make sure that it stayed sustainable within their cap. And it is the negotiator's job, and you know that's Brian Hampton, Prag Marathe. It's their job to make sure that that they're not just giving away their their boss's money. They have to make sure that they're uh, negotiating properly. And if Bosa was dug in with a hard line, this is something that wouldn't be uh, adjudicated until the deadline pressure came. I always talked about it as a game of chicken, right? Two cars careening toward each other, but you don't swerve in a game of chicken. If you're still a mile away from the collision, nobody's going to swerve. There's no, no incentive for either side to swerve. The swerves start to happen when you're about to hit. And that's what we saw last week. Bosa really wanted to get the deal done. I think Adam Schefter reported that it wasn't quite like TJ Watts where TJ actually went to the front office and kicked the door down and walked in and said that he wanted to sign the contract. It wasn't like that, <laughs> but, but Bosa, I think told his agents, all right, time to wrap up because I want to win defensive player of the year. I'm not going to win defensive player of the year. If I start missing time, you know, I, I think that's that sense of deadline pressure helped move things along there. And the 49ers well, Bosa had a lot of leverage, 49ers needed him out there. Yeah. He was their top graded defensive player on Sunday. So both sides had reason to swerve before the season started. They didn't have reason to swerve earlier than that. Feels like a few guys could have battled over that who had the best defensive grade. That's how excellent that defense performed pretty much on Sunday. Let's talk about what might be still in flux, though, defensively. And it's the Diamador Lenore, Ambry Thomas, Isaiah Oliver, Samuel Womack. Like, it feels like Steve Wilkes is trying to figure out still what he has back there and the right way to use it. Yeah, and, you know, they played Isaiah Oliver in the second half at nickel. And in the first half, they used Diamador Lenore kicking inside with Ambry Thomas on the outside. They said in the preseason that this would be more sophisticated, that the nickel back alignment would be determined by 
what the matchups were. So if it's a bigger tight end in the slot, they're going to use Isaiah Oliver. If it's a shiftier receiver, they're going to go to the Yamar Lenore. I actually think that probably will still be the plan, but you have to remember preseason is not taken as seriously as far as getting all 22 guys out there as it used to be. This is the first time that all 11 starters defensively were playing together. And it's, it gets complex on a football sideline to be mixing and matching your nickel, depending on wh wh who's the slot receiver on the other side, right? So I, I do think that the 49ers probably simplified things for week one just to get everybody familiar it's a long season, and they decided, hey, let's give a half to Demo Lenore. Let's give a half to Isaiah Oliver. I do expect that to become a more complex mix and match now that they have had some rehearsal time. Um, on the line of scrimmage, there's no doubt that you know Trent Williams clearly wears the cap of I'm the best offensive lineman on this team. I think we're in the league. It, it, yeah, <laughs> uh, I think that we're starting to see the man who wears the I'm the second best offensive lineman on this team officially find his cap, and, and that's Aaron Banks. He is turning into everything that they drafted him to be. A little bit of a slow start to his career, but it seems like he has really caught up. Yeah, I mean, and it's tough because the 49ers were acting, asking Aaron Banks to really do two distinct things that could be distinctly different. Uh, they They wanted a zone blocker. So they wanted somebody who could really move in Kyle Shanahan's scheme. But at the same time, they were saying, hey, maybe we should we should develop a little bit more power inside. So A, that that guard can anchor against pass rushes because guys like Aaron Donald will bowl right over you. I mean, they're they're he's, Donald is quick, but he's also strong, right? And there's there's a lot of strong interior defensive linemen who, if you're too light up front, that you're not gonna be able to anchor against the bull rush. So they want it somebody who who could be big and powerful but could also move and so they went out and got the, the biggest lineman they've had in, in Aaron Banks at 330 plus pounds but they had to kind of rework his body there were a lot of fat there a lot of baby fat from college they had to rework his body into somebody that could move well enough for the outside zone yet maintain that strength to be able to do what you know, more gap scheme stuff I know they're running a little bit more of that but also to be able to pass protect so that, that's why it took a year it, it, I mean, this doesn't just happen overnight. It's not like build a player in Madden and then add him to your team. You know, you've you got to do this in the weight room. you got to do it with the nutrition. And they did. I thought he looked good last year, but there were still some holes in the game. And he was rock solid, clean sheet in week one and pass protection. And Damon, they were blocking hat on a hat better than they ever have in week one uh, in the run game. That, you know, we had always talked about this team needing to find its stride. We talk about mid-season form, playoff form. I think they were in at least mid-season form by week one, and that 65-yarder to McCaffrey really illustrated it. My only complaint about the entire afternoon, besides like, okay, McCaffrey probably played five too many plays out there. He could have taken him off the field earlier in the fourth was that, you know, Colton McKivitz got left out on an island against T.J. Watt, and T.J. Watt is going to hand a lot of dudes their lunch out on that island. I was surprised that, you know, Kyle didn't do more to help out a guy playing into a, a spot. I, I'll say this about Colton McKivitz. I think the thing that he and Mike McGlinchey are going to have in common is that they're a lot better than their reputations because they're low light is never going to be as good as the highlight. You know, when, when they get beat, they get beat bad. But they really don't get beat that bad that often where you have to say, all right, there's there's a problem there. Colton McKivitt's a, a, a baptism by fire if there ever was one against a, a guy like T.J. Watt. Yeah, well, you know, we're going to have to see with Colton McKivitt. So he, McGlinchey had enough on tape, especially in the run game over the years to where I think football people understood. He saw how much the Broncos paid for him, so he's worth something. The thing with McKivitt's is that he just hasn't played – enough to be okay this is a known commodity i think he's still a relatively unknown commodity now the 49ers have seen behind closed doors they've seen the practices but of course the game is a lot different than practice especially if tj watts on the other side and especially if nick bosa hasn't been at practice and i think that that hurt colton mckivitz that might have been the biggest negative downstream effect of Nick Bosa's holdout is that colton mckivitz didn't get reps against him to prepare during this training camp point blank the right side of the offensive line is going to need to be a whole lot better for the 49ers to get to where they want to go. Every and, defensive coordinator is yeah. going right through there. This, yeah, you don't need to be an offensive or defensive coordinator to see that's the attack point right there.
Exactly. So I don't know where this goes. I do know that, you know, everybody just thinks that these players grow on trees and they're like, oh, go pay for another offensive tackle. In general, there is a shortage of quality tackles in the NFL. Um, almost every single team would, would like an upgrade at one of its tackle spots right now. And uh, it's just not something that just happens like that. Now, the 49ers have money. They have draft picks. I don't know who's going to be available and who isn't. Everybody talking about Lael Collins right now. There's a reason why the Bengals released right. him. You don't just release good tackles in, in the league right now unless there's something that is making him relatively unplayable, and he's coming off an ACL uh, late last season. So anyway, it's, it's one of those things where your best bet is in-house development. That's the path they decided to take with Colton McKivitz, and you don't give up on the in-house development route after one game against TJ Watt. You see if he can take some of his mistakes against one of the game's best edge rushers, apply the learned lessons, and look better in week two. And same thing with Spencer Burford, who got worked a couple times by Larry Ogunjobi. So the problem is that both of those guys are next to each other on the line. So there are a lot of combination blocks. There's a lot of communication that has to happen between right guard and right tackle. And if it doesn't, and both of those guys play poorly, you look really bad on the right side and you're relying on Brock Purdy to, to do a lot of Houdini acts, escape acts. And um, he did those for the most part on Sunday, but it does have to get better. Anyone can beat anybody in this league. It's what makes it so intoxicating, but for a big loud win over a division rival on the road, when you were rolling in with supposedly, you know, one, one of the least glamorous rosters in the NFL, the LA Rams really, you know, I thought won the, award of biggest surprise win in week one uh, based on expectations and, and what we talked about, what we didn't talk about going into this season. Now that's the next opponent for the 49ers. It feels like it might even be too early to start previewing that game, but real quick thumbnail sketch ideas. What do you expect to see out of the Rams at SoFi come Sunday, David? Well, the Rams just stifled the Seahawks. I think Seattle only had like a handful of yards in the second half offensively and then on the other side of the ball Matthew Stafford uh threw for 330 they have a, a new receiver Puka Nakua out of BYU a fifth round rookie 112 receiving yards I mean they uh, Stafford looked very very accurate even though Cooper Cup is currently on IR even though his is, wife said he doesn't really relate to this guy <laughs> yeah. well yeah I remember that he's too old to relate to, to yeah. all his rookies but you know here's the thing Matthews, we already knew that Matthew Stafford uh, always looks really good if he's not pressured. And Seattle doesn't really have a pass rush. That's been that's why the Rams have owned Seattle over the years and why the 49ers have owned the Rams over the years. is because one, one of these teams is a pass rush and one doesn't. The 49ers gave Jared Goff hell with their pass rush, and they have given Matthew Stafford hell with their pass rush. And I, I don't think that the Rams are going to be able to hold the 49ers to only five pressures in what was it, like 38, I think, dropbacks for Matthew Stafford last week. That's what they did against the Seahawks. They stonewalled that offensive line. If, you know, against the 49ers, you're either going to have to run the ball, and they didn't against, I mean, they did run it, but not efficiently. You're going to have to run the ball efficiently. They only ran for 2.8, 2.9 per carry against Seattle, or you're going to have to pass protect your ass off. As we saw in the games last year, the Rams didn't do that. Uh, one of the worst O-line exhibitions I've ever seen at the NFL level was Monday Night Football. Rams playing with a center I hadn't heard of and a bunch of guys out of position against the 49ers. 49ers had 28 pressures in one game. That's an insane yeah. amount of pressures, right? So the Rams looked better in week eight when they got some of their lines set, but it still wasn't good enough. And by then, the 49ers offense had taken off. That was the McCaffrey three touchdowns, three different ways kind of game. Uh, I just... You know, look at the Rams, and I say they haven't proven that they can truly block the 49ers yet. Even in the NFC title game that they won, there are a lot of other reasons why the Rams won that game, and it was the only game in, what, nine tries or however many tries it's been that they have beaten the 49ers. So until something materially changes in the advantage that the 49ers have had along the line of scrimmage, uh, th this series will continue uh, going in that direction, and I don't think anything's materially changed. The only thing that's changed is the 49ers have Javon Hargrave now, and they didn't before. Uh, David, you're great at what you do because you're not in the speculation business. You're not in the ginning up outrage business. You're just covering what's in front of you, and you don't pretend to know things you don't. And having said all that, it feels like 4-0 is out there and available for the 49ers. I mean, they, they, get past, they get past the Rams here with the Pittsburgh Steelers being the big stumbling block, I thought, to a 4-0 start. 
I mean, Giants on a short week based on what we've seen, and we know they're not that bad, but I don't think they're ready to come and beat the 49ers in their home opener on a Thursday. And then after that, 49ers should be able to beat Arizona anywhere. Any team in the NFL should be able to beat Arizona anywhere. 4-0 teams historically have, I believe, an 87% chance of reaching the postseason. And since that's where the Niners' season will actually begin, I keep on saying, yeah, it's the regular season. But this show starts in the NFC title game, so you better damn well get there. Four and zero would be a great way to start the year. Your thoughts? <laughs> I think I think they really want and need the one seed. The statistically, yeah. the difference between the one seed and and having to play a wild card game. I don't care if it's at on the road or at home. Statistically, the one seed has such a massive advantage. Um, I mean, we're talking. I think one seeds. I, I did this math back in 2019. Uh, one seeds make the Super Bowl something like 70 to 75 percent of the time, and wild card teams make it something like 15 to 20 percent of the time. That, that might even be high for the wild card teams, but there's a big, big gap. And now the season's longer. The regular season has an extra game, which means that the importance of a buy is even greater than it was before. Uh, 49ers are a West Coast team, so any flight is likely to be longer in the NFL. They're traveling 30,000 air miles this year, which is the second highest behind only Seattle, another West Coast team. That's enough to circumnavigate the globe. This kind of stuff takes a toll on you in these long marathon seasons. So I think it's even more important for a West Coast team that's been on a lot of deep runs recently too. So these veterans, you know, the the, the, the odometer has, has picked up on these guys. It's so important for a team like the 49ers to get that first round by. So when you talk about four and oh, I think, okay, does that put them in better position for first round by? Of course it does. Cause they're undefeated. That's what I think about. I'm not thinking about playoff odds. I'm thinking about first round by odds because the last two seasons, the 49ers, I think have been ultimately tripped up uh, by well, 2021 for sure. There was exhaustion there, right? They had a, they squeaked their way into the playoffs against the Rams week 18 uh, Garoppolo had the torn thumb. They went to Dallas. They won their narrowly. Garoppolo tore up his shoulder on top of the thumb. Then they went to Green Bay into cold weather. They somehow got it out of win. Then they play the Rams in the NFC Championship game. You want to talk about the real reason they lost to the Rams. It wasn't because of a talent disadvantage up front. They were up entering the fourth quarter. But at a certain point, I mean, have you seen the – have you seen the – um the it's an awesome movie side side note i'll bring this back full circle in about 20 seconds have you seen free solo free so uh that is that is about the uh, alex honnold the rock climber yeah 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 yeah, yeah the, the, yes yeah yeah the okay. guy climbs with no ropes no nothing just hands and his hands okay yeah so that was my metaphor i wrote it in 2021 one of the quotes was if you push the edge eventually you're gonna find the edge there's there's gonna be an edge somewhere and right. the 2021 49ers pushed the edge so far, and they found it in the fourth quarter of the NFC Championship game. Exhaustion hit them. So anyway, you want to avoid that. And to avoid that, you need to get the one seed. So when you say 4-0, hopefully I brought it full circle now. When you say 4-0, uh, I think, okay, can they get the one seed with that? And, yeah, of course, if you stay undefeated, you're going to get the one seed. So that should be the goal. Did you enjoy the Aaron Rodgers era of the New York Jets? It was too short. It was too short. Hey, you know, and it just, it, it, hey, we're talking about pass protection for the 49ers. Did you see how, um, what a train wreck the Jets had a tackle? Ended up getting Aaron Rodgers hurt. So, and they were all trying to like, there's a big scandal now. They're all trying to cut block. And Aaron Rodgers wanted them to actually block, not cut block. Because when you cut block, you're expecting the quarterback to get the ball out quickly. Aaron Rodgers wants to actually go through his progressions and make plays downfield. I don't see how you can invest that much in Aaron Rodgers. 75 million guaranteed, obviously trade for him, and then not have the protection in front of him to run the scheme that Aaron Rodgers is good at. You just want him to be a quick one read slant guy. Um, and, and it caused Aaron to get hurt. So, I, I mean, yeah, it, it was not good. I wanted to see more of it. I think it, no, nobody likes guys getting, getting hurt, right? I, you want to see the best talent in the league on a week in, week out basis. And now we're going to have to watch Zach Wilson with the Jets. Yeah. A lot of primetime matchups. It really is a shame. I mean, it's hard to feel bad for New Yorkers, but Jets fans, they really are a, a very, very special breed. You talk about enough miles to circumnavigate a globe. You're going to be traveling almost with the 49ers each and every week. Like I said, you just went Pittsburgh. You were in Maine. Uh, most important question. I buried the lead. Do you prefer the hot lobster roll or the cold lobster roll? 
the lobster needs to be cold with the toasted roll, right? So correct. Yeah, that there, there the needs to be temperature answer. differential. Absolutely. Uh, Woodhouse Fish Company in San Francisco. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Yeah. Um, they, they make a good one. I believe they fly the lobster in from, from Maine. So that's the way you got to do it. And they have cold on the inside. And the meat, the protein is cold. And, and the toasted, warm, buttery roll. Pierogies right. in the press box in Pittsburgh. Primani Brothers. How, how was the spread? So I didn't get any Primani Brothers there because I could do that in San Francisco. I go. It used to be called Giordano Brothers. They changed the name to Rudy's. It's right here at, at 16th and... Valencia and they I went on Thursday night for a minute, weren't they? And now they're, did they move? They closed. And then okay. somebody was like, wait, wait, I love Giordano brothers. I'm just going to buy it and reopen it with the same menu. Thank God they did. Cause way too much stuff has been closing around here. Uh, that's the Steelers bar. And it, people don't know they stuff everything. They love stuffing fries on everything in Pittsburgh, but they <laughs> put the fries, they put the coleslaw, the fried egg, if you wanted onto the sandwich with the protein and the cheese. And well, it's really gluttonous, but it's quite good. But it's just as good in San Francisco as it is in Pittsburgh. So I had it here. I'm guessing there'll be some healthier options when you get down to SoFi, which really has turned into Candlestick South. It's amazing the way 49ers fans take over that building. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, I think the, the craziest was week 18, the game the 49ers won. The Rams try to double down. Like the Niners probably had 85 to 90% of the seats with their fans in that game. That caused the Rams to freak out ahead of the NFC championship. And they, yeah, I remember Kelly Stafford was begging Rams fans not to sell their tickets. And I, it helped to a certain degree. It might have been 70 30 by the NFC title game. But regardless of how hard the Rams tried, uh, they were not going to stop that stadium from having a home field advantage for the 49ers. And I expect more of the same. Hey, I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for uh, uh, finally catching up. You were on the road. We tried to put this together. You were a man of your word. You promised me a training camp. You'd hop on to this new grand career experiment of mine, and I thank you very, very much. I've been watching your page to sort of figure out how to do it. You're really good at what you do, David, and it was wonderful to have you here today. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'm. hey, I'm willing to come on more during the season, if you'll have me. So, uh, of course, and you're doing a great job, Damon. I, I, I do love watching your stuff. You've got some level-headed takes, so everybody make sure you uh, hit that subscribe button for Damon. Hit the like, whatever. I don't know what helps the algorithm, but uh, whatever does help this guy out because you do great work, man. I'll tell you what, David Lombardi's going to help that algorithm. I know that much. Thanks an awful lot, pal. Thank you.